I'm reading for the New Living Translation. Here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the worker slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away at night. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you, Valeria, for that beautiful reminder and song of, of uh, how important faith is. Um, I think of a, a text, one of my favorite texts in the book of John. It says, uh, uh, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And uh, that always reminds me when I'm feeling a little bit bad about myself, how good God is. There are some very special people here that I want to introduce you to. <laughs> um, when I was just a baby pastor in 1989, I, um, well, let's see, it was probably about 1991, uh, they inflicted me upon the poor Sholo Church. <laughs> and the Sholo Church raised me as a pastor. <laughs> Uh, and I appreciate them very much, but one of the, uh, three of those people that uh, had to put up with me in those very, very early year, years are here, and uh, Glenn and Bonnie Poliak are some of my best friends in the whole world, love them dearly, just raise your hand where you are, but there's a very special lady with them whose name is Georgia. Georgia Brown is 95 years old, when was it, Wednesday, Thursday? Yesterday, Georgia, uh, just love you to love you to the moon and back, and uh, glad you're here with us. Uh, uh, so, uh, just great to see you guys. And um, uh, let's uh, pray before we begin. Now, this this uh, sermon series uh, came out of Matthew chapter 13, and Jesus told a whole uh, string of parables, just one right after the other, in um, in Matthew 13. And um, we've been talking about uh, seeds and soil and fruit bearing and what it means. And uh, this, uh, this parable takes a little different twist. And uh, you'll, we'll see what it is as we go, go on. But before we do, uh, we need to ask God to bless us. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your good word to us. Lord, we thank you for the stories that remind us of the way the kingdom of heaven works. And it's not always the way that we uh, think it should. It's not the way, certainly the way that the world works, but it's the way you work. And so, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for uh, your word. And we ask that the Holy Spirit be here among us as we open your word, Lord, that it speaks to our heart. You promise that when you send out your word, it will not return to you void. So, Lord, may your word and the seeds that you plant here today bear rich fruit for you in the kingdom of heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so we've been uh, going through this uh, story in Matthew 13. The story of the, is the third in a series of parables that Jesus to told about farming. And uh, he told these while he was out by the Sea of Galilee. And if we look over in Matthew 13, if you have your Bibles, on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered unto him so that when he got into the boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So there we see this beautiful picture of Jesus sitting in this little fisherman's boat. And uh, uh, Sister White says in the Desire of Ages, what a scene for angels to, com to contemplate. The glorious commander seated in a, in a humble fisherman's boat preaching about the things of the kingdom of God. So if you can imagine in your mind, Jesus sitting in the little boat, uh, the great crowd is gathered around him there on the shore, and it's a little cove there, and there's thousands of people there trying to hear, trying to hold, grasp the, the words that Jesus is speaking. And up on the sides of the mountains, all around these terraced fields, there's workers going around, uh, casting seed or, 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 or working behind a team of oxen to plow the ground. And Jesus begins to tell the parables of the kingdom to the people as they listen in rapt attention. And so he told the, the parable of the, uh, of the different kinds of soil that a farmer might have when he sows seed. And I'm reviewing a little bit from, our, from our, uh, the previous sermons. Um, in um, uh, the first 
parable that Jesus told. He talked about the farmer that cast the seed about and some of it went on the hard path. Some of it went in the thorns and the weeds. Some of it went on the stony ground and some of it went in good soil. And so uh, uh, we know that, that Jesus uh, told these stories to help us to understand the different conditions of the human heart. And each one of these soils represents a human heart. And God sends forth the gospel word, the good word of truth. And sometimes that seed falls upon stone, on, on hard ground, ground that has been trampled on. And uh, the seed just kind of bounces off of it. Or the birds eat it up. Sometimes the seed goes uh, into a, a ground where there's just not enough depth. And right, there's a little layer of soil, but right underneath that soil are, are stones and, and rocks and, and things. So when the, the little seed tries to grow, the stones get in the way. And, and uh, when the sun comes out, it kind of burns the, the little plant and it withers. And sometimes there's thorns and weeds that the seed try to grow in, but it's choked out and crowded by these weeds. And Jesus said that those that weedy ground uh, represents the uh, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of, of riches. And it chokes the word, chokes out the word. But sometimes the seed lands in good soil and there it interacts with the nutrients in the soil and the and the the, uh, the great, wonderful thing that takes place when God grows seed. So farmer, the farmer equals Jesus. The seed is the gospel and the soil is the human heart. And each one of those human hearts, we, we can have a hard heart. Have you guys ever been hard hearted before? When something came to you and you knew it was from God, but it was like, no, I will not. I will not go and work in my in my father's field today. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes uh, uh, the, the, it falls on stony ground and, and that represents when, when the seed comes to us and, and we have these things in our heart that are, that are, are uh, maybe, maybe standing in between us and God. And God says, well, let me work with you on that. Let me, let me remove those, that, that, those rocks out of your heart so that the seed will go deep in that good soil. Have you ever seen the field where there's, where there's mounds and mounds of stones that the farmer over the years has, has, has picked up those stones and maybe made a, a fence out of them or a path out of them? Every one of those stones had to remove, be removed before the, the uh, field was ready for a good crop of grain. And, and God offers to do that for us, if we'll let him. The thorny ground, of course, represents when there's other priorities in our life. When there's other priorities other than God, and we, we get busy and, and, and we think, well, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll be a little bit too busy, so maybe I won't go to church today or, or, uh, or some other priority that we put in front of God instead of listening to God's word in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then all these other things will, will be added unto you as well. And the thorny ground represents our, our, our priorities when they get askew. And if we don't make God a priority in front of the world, then the world will make its priorities in our hearts in front of God. That's just the way it works. That's probably the most dangerous to Christians, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, because uh, we're always saying someday, you know, someday I'm going to read my Bible more. Someday I'm going to pray more. That day is today, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, those priorities are going to come into our life and God will get crowded farther and farther on the back burner until maybe we won't even be able to see him anymore. But then there's the good dirt, the open, receptive heart. That, that makes God the first priority and, and allows God to work in their life and God plants the, the gospel uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit and bears fruit. And, and brothers and sisters, we talked about how we can have each one of those types of soil in our hearts at the same time even. But God is the dirt doctor and when, when we allow God and we ask God to come in and say, God, please break up this hard heart that I have. I don't want a hard heart. 
But please come in and break up my hard heart and, and help me to have that good soil. Lord, please take those, those stones, those things that are, that are in between me and you. Take those, that rocky ground and turn it into good, fruitful soil. Lord, please pull those weeds in my heart and help me to put you first. And God is the dirt doctor. He can improve any kind of soil if we let him, if we allow him. The second parable was similar uh, to this, and it's found in Mark chapter 4. And here the farmer is, is Jesus, and the seed is the gospel. But in this parable, it was about the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and how this, the Holy Spirit uh, comes in. We don't understand it. And the Holy Spirit comes in if we allow Him, if we invite Him to come into our hearts and the Holy Spirit will take that seed and will grow us into, into Christians. And, and it goes along to the, the song that, that Valeria sang so beautifully. And sometimes we don't see the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't sense that, that God... In other, word, in other words, our feelings are, are so powerful. And, and if I feel this way about myself, then how can God possibly love me? Right? Have you ever felt that way? I have, I have, I've been there. I've, I've been in the depths of, of depression and despair and thought, you know, if I feel this way about myself, then surely God can have no use for me either. But that's not the way God works. We don't walk by feeling. We walk by faith. We love God by faith, even when we don't feel like it. We know that God loves us by faith, even when we don't sense it. We go to church on Sabbath by faith. We pay our tithe by faith. We, we are true to our husbands and our wives by faith. We are loving to each other by faith. Everything that we do, brothers and sisters, we do by faith. Not by feeling. If we did everything, if we did, if we did everything that we do by feeling, what kind of world would we live in? Well, it's the kind of world that you walk into when you walk out these back doors. We don't live by feeling. We live by faith. We trust by faith. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works. And, and Nicodemus didn't understand that. And Jesus came to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, look outside. You see, the, see those wind? You see that rustling of the leaves? That's the wind. You don't see it, but it's working. You don't understand it, but it's there. Nicodemus, God will work in your heart if you open your heart and let him in. So we see that that principle. We don't understand how the seed grows. But if we trust God, if we if we ask him to continue to cultivate our life and and to and, and to work with that that hard ground, the stony ground, the thorny ground, then eventually God is going to do what God has promised to do in each one of us. And uh, we looked at that beautiful text uh, in Philippians chapter one, verse six, where it says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God who started this great work in you will keep it, keep at it, I should say, and bring it to a flourishing finish in the very day of Christ Jesus appears. That's Philippians 1, verse 6. You ever heard it in, in the message? He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. I just like that version. It just pops in my mind. It tells me that God started the work in me and if I will trust him, and abide in him, then he's going to finish the work in me. And the way that he does that is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, Grow in grace and the understanding and the knowledge of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, there's no other way to grow, brothers and sisters. You want to grow any way? You want to grow in God? You grow in grace or you don't grow at all. Grow in grace, the Bible says. Well, have you ever uh, tried to grow a garden and just ended up with a bunch of weeds? <laughs> you ever, uh, 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 in this third parable uh, in Matthew 13, it's a, in this parable we have a weed problem as well. But they, things are a little different in this one. In this parable, uh, we have the, the, the sower that goes out and the, and the master farmer and he sows. So let's read it together. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now, what, that was a dirty trick, wasn't it? <laughs> so where, where do you get a bag of weed seed from? That's what I'd like to know. 
You know, I, 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 found, a, I found a picture of, a, of, of grass seed. Um, well, let's, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Surprising what you find when you Google a picture for grass seed or weed seed. I didn't know that that was uh, out there, but it is. <laughs> it's quite available. So uh, there we go. An enemy did that too, by the way. So but notice the difference. Uh, in this parable, it says the, uh, the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? And he said what? An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. There's an enemy at work in the field of God. The servant asked him, uh, do you want us to go and pull them up? He said, no, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. You might uproot the wheat with them. Now, there's a, another uh, text that Jesus referred to this very thing in, Ma in Matthew 15, 13. He said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be what? Pulled up by the roots. So the servants want to help, right? They say, Master, what you want us to go out and just start pulling weeds? We'll go get them. You know, uh, in, in the world that we live in today, uh, here's, a, here's a bag of, of good seed. Nobody likes weeds. This, uh, if you look up in, that, in the right-hand corner of that picture, uh, what does it say? Anybody can read that? Anybody with really, really good eyeballs? Well, I'll tell you what it says. It says 99.9% .9 weed-free. That's what it says. Because you don't buy a bag of, of good seed and expect to have a bunch of weeds come up in it. Unless that's what you ordered in the first place. <laughs> Nobody likes weeds, right? Certified weed seed free straw and feed required on public lands. That looks like Sholo right up there, doesn't it? But if you take your critter out to the, to the forest, not even the forest service wants you to have, have a, a, a bunch of weeds being planted out in the forest. Nobody likes weeds. So we get Roundup, right? <laughs> now there's a, a few problems with Roundup. That's what the servants wanted to do. Lord, if they live today, if this parable happened today, they would say, you know, Monsanto has this excellent product, Master. It's called Roundup. And if you spray Roundup, I guarantee you it will kill everything. Won't it? <laughs> That's the pr and that therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. Maybe you guys have heard of the... Uh, Monarch butterfly. Have you ever seen? Have you seen a lot of monarchs lately? When we were out in California, there was a, a what was the name of the little butterfly that was flying through there by the billions? Uh, a painted lady, I think, they, that was the name of the butterfly that was flying through. A, uh, I was at a fun. I I performed a funeral for my last aunt, last living aunt, uh, on my mom's side. And uh, there in, in, in California, that, in, where my brother lived down in Fallbrook, um, the uh, painted ladies were, go were going through town. But you don't see very many uh, monarch butterflies anymore. Monarch butterflies, they, they, one, the scientists that study this kind of thing, sit around and count butterflies. <laughs> uh, in, in 1990, uh, the butterflies started to decrease. There wasn't near as many monarch butterflies. And the reason is... The, the reason that, that they think that is, is because monarchs uh, uh, lay their eggs in a milk, what's called a milkweed. And uh, milkweed is a bane to farmers. And so farmers got a hold of this excellent product called Roundup. And uh, in, in 1990, I think uh, they, there was around 11 million pounds of Roundup sprayed. In the last few years, there's 300 million pounds of, of Roundup sprayed on crops every year. And, uh, but when you mess with nature, it, it comes back to bite you sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. So we have all the issues that, that with, with Roundup. And then they, so they said, well, let's, uh, let's develop these genetically modified plants that don't uh, that, that, that Roundup won't kill. And so that's why we have GMOs in our corn and our soy and in our wheat. And there's just about no corn or soy or wheat you can find 
that doesn't have traces of glyphosate in it, that which is Roundup. Well, the only problem is now is now there, uh, you know, in the medical world, uh, people are giving uh, antibiotics for 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 any little, you know, you get a cold and you go in and get antibiotic, and and before long, uh, there's these mutations that take place, and now we have what they call the superbugs, right? The superbugs that will not respond to any kind of antibiotics. And guess what happened in the weed world? There were weeds that developed that will not respond will not die. You can spray all the Roundup on them you want and they won't die. And you know what you call them? They call them super weeds. <laughs> super weeds. So the master farmer said, no, don't pull them up by the roots. No, please don't spray any Roundup on the field. Yeah, whatever you do, because he's the master farmer. He's the dirt doctor. He can improve any kind of soil. But he doesn't want us killing things that don't need to be killed. Well, uh, in this parable, when we look at this, uh, Jesus' disciples didn't get it right away either. And they said, explain it to us, Lord. In this parable, Jesus is the farmer. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, Jesus said. The, uh, when we go on to the explanation of the parable, um, Jesus said, no, don't pull it up. Don't spray Roundup, he says, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first, collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So we see some different things in this parable. Uh, Jesus is the farmer. When we get to the uh, when we get to the explanation, Jesus' disciples they didn't understand it, so they said, "Jesus, tell, help us out with it." So he did. He answered. By the way, you know how to interpret the Bible? You let the Bible interpret itself. That's how you interpret the Bible. When when uh, someone takes a a passage here and says, "Well, I'm going to try to apply what's going on," and we see that happening all the time when people are setting dates for Jesus coming. And, and so forth, and, and over and over again, the same thing happens. There's disappointment, and the world looks at the church and laughs and say, those crazy people that believe this book. Jesus said, let the, let the Bible interpret itself. And so Jesus interprets for us. He answers, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. So here's all this, this, this beautiful uh, uh, soil and there's wheat popping up in it, but there's also weeds. So when I look out at you guys, I see uh, beautiful wheat popping up. <laughs> but don't you dare turn to the other person beside you and start pulling weeds. <laughs> That's not your job, is it? It's not your job. Yeah, yeah this is a wonderful picture uh, that Jesus draws for us. The bad seed, the weed seed, or the children of Satan, the enemy. Harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels of God. What a, what a picture that is. It's a picture of the second coming of Jesus when God goes to gather his people uh, from, from the earth. God has his children, Satan has his children as well. And sometimes it's not so easy to tell them apart. It's not so easy to tell them apart. But notice the wisdom and tenderness of God as the master farmer in this parable. The servants, they just want to tear everything out. Let's clean this place up. Let's clear this church out. Let's make sure that all the, all the people that don't see things exactly the way that we see things, let's take them out right now. We need a pure church. The servants want to tear out the weeds. They want a, a pure field of grain. But God says, no, don't do that. I don't want you to harm the wheat accidentally. And God says something that's hard for us to accept sometimes and hard for us to understand. He says, let them grow together till the harvest and I'll be in charge of doing the separating. I'll be in charge of that. Why? 
because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But just so it is clear to us, Jesus says there will be a harvest of wheat and there will be a harvest of weed, the, of weeds. The wheat goes to God's barn. The weeds get bundled up and burned. The wheat is saved. The weeds are lost and are destroyed in the end. So lest we misunderstand that, God is very clear to us and tells us that parable in, in many different ways. There are several illustrations of, of how this happened in Scripture. Um, Judas was a disciple of Jesus. The Bible says when Jesus called his disciples to them and in Matthew, uh, it says he ordained 12. He called them together after spending all night in prayer, as it says, in the Desire of Ages. And then he called his disciples unto himself. And, and the Desire of Ages says that Judas pressed his way in among the disciples. And one time Jesus even said to Judas, he said, uh, Judas said, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. And, the, and Jesus knew that Judas's heart was just a, a, a kind of bent toward selfishness. And Jesus knew that he was disappoint Judas's hopes badly. And he said, the birds of the air have have nests and the foxes of the air, uh, you know, that run around, they have their little den, but the Son of Man doesn't even have the place to look, put his head up at night. Do you still want to follow me, Judas? So Judas was with Jesus. He was with the disciples. He, he was there at the same time during that three and a half years of ministry. He saw the same miracles. He heard the same gracious words that came from, from Jesus' mouth as he taught people and told parables like this one. The Bible says that when he chose to betray Jesus, that Satan entered him. Satan entered him. And in, in John 17, verse 12, Jesus called him a son of perdition. A son of perdition. He's a child of Satan. He's one of the weeds in my wheat field. He's one of the weeds. Did Jesus know all that about Judas? Did he know what Judas was going to do? Did he, did he know him? Of course he did. He knew, knew his heart. He knows all of our hearts. He knew what Judas would do. He was patient with Judas. He loved Judas. He treated him with love and respect. He gave him every chance to change and repent. But in the crisis of Calvary, Judas was separated out and ended up taking his own life with only a few hours left before Jesus would be raised again in victory. You know, I'm thankful. You know, Jesus called Judas the son of perdition. And that's what we all were at one time, too. The Bible says that while we were enemies of God, while we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us. And that's how God showed us how much he loved us. And then in, in that wonderful text in John 1, 12, it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. God took the sons and daughters of perdition and made us sons and daughters of God. Behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we might be called the children of God. Once sons and daughters of perdition, now children of the heavenly father. Praise God for that. God took some weeds and made weed out of them. You know, another example that we see in history was the destruction of Jerusalem. When the Romans uh, uh, came to Jerusalem and surrounded Jerusalem, uh, Jesus had warned his, his disciples. He had warned them, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. He says, don't come down from your house. Don't go back into your house to pick up stuff. Don't try to go close out your bank accounts and take your money. He says, just get out of Dodge or Jerusalem. <laughs> get out. And they did. And in the book, uh, Great Controversy, it says not one Christian died because the Romans, uh, they went off chasing this rabbit here and went there. The Christians escaped. But then they came back and in the ensuing destruction, millions of, of Jewish people lost their lives or were enslaved. Um, but not one Christian died because they listened to the word of God. Those followers of Jesus had remembered his words and his warnings to flee Jerusalem. And not one Christian died in the destruction. Not one because God knows how to separate 
the wheat from the weeds. He knows how to do it. You know, we were talking about in Sabbath school this morning, we're talking about a great crisis that's coming on the world. Um, I believe in the very near future that we're going to see these things increase in frequency. We're going to see things like what happened in New Zealand here just uh, yesterday. That's going to increase in frequency as the, the Bible says that uh, iniquity will abound. The love of many will, will wax cold and people with no love in their hearts will do terrible things. And the Bible talks about that great crisis that's approaching us rapidly and, and, uh, uh, I remember Sean Booster preaching about it and talking about, uh, you know, the signs of Jesus coming, talking about the signs of Jesus coming. And he talked about his wife being in labor. And, uh, and when she first started, I, uh, you know, about half of you have been in labor here. Half of you will never experience that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But you know, there's first there's that little twinge, and then there's uh, you know, and you know when the, when they start coming uh, ten minutes apart, and then nine minutes apart, and then then eight minutes apart, and they get to start to get more more powerful and more painful and stronger and stronger until until that you, your wife reaches out her hands and grabs you by the throat and says, "Honey, it's time," and this is your fault. <laughs> and those contractions come closer and closer. Together and until until the birth of the, of the child occurs, and Sean says that is what Jesus was talking about when Jesus sit, was describing the end of the world. Things like this are going to happen. They're going to happen more frequently, and the, and the incidences are going to become more and more 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 powerful. And 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 uh, until uh, the sign of Jesus uh, appearing appears in the cloud, and brothers and sisters, we're living in the midst of that right now. And I believe it's Satan's determined effort to to cause us to to forget our identity as wheat. And wants us to think that we're just a bunch of weeds. But God knows his his people, he knows our hearts, and if we will abide in him, he will bear the fruit in us that needs to be born that only he can do. The Bible says in um, in Matthew chapter uh, 13 verses 40 to 43 it says as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire it will so it will be at the end of the age the son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil they will throw them in the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that's the bad news here's the good news then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father Shine like the sun. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The Bible teaches there will be a great separation at the end of time. There will be sheep and goats. There will be wheat and there will be weeds. I want to be a wheat. I want to be a sheep. I want to shine in the glory that Jesus gives me when he lives in my heart. How about you? Let's pray. Father God, we know the time is coming when uh, there's going to be that separation. And Lord, we want to be so firmly rooted in you, so firmly grounded in you that nothing can separate us from, from you. Nothing can take us from your hand. Lord, we know that you have promised to do that if we will let you. So right now, Lord, in the quietness of this holy place, we open our hearts to our Savior, Jesus. We ask Him to come in. We ask Him to make us wheat for God's kingdom. And we pray all these things in His name. Amen.